This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody. I've got a great episode that I can't wait to share with Tanya and you guys. Well, I've got a really sad, sad story. Have you heard of the Riley Fox case? I think I have, but I can't remember. I'm sure if you tell me, it may trigger something, but... Well, this case is one of those cases that haunted me for years, and I really wanted to share it with everybody, and I'm going to let you... All know in advance it is about a three-year-old child. So if you can't handle it, don't listen and don't send us nasty emails, okay? That being said, if you can handle it, buckle up because I'm going to start. All right. The central events underlying this case evoke every parent's most visceral fear. The abduction of a child from their own home. While they're sleeping in another room. My heart race is just saying that. I know. In June of 2004, Kevin and Melissa Fox were living with their children. They had a daughter, Riley. She was three. And a son, Tyler. He was six. They lived in Wilmington, Illinois. And that's a small town located in a rural area about 60 miles southwest of Chicago. You ever heard of it? No, I haven't. Melissa and Kevin both grew up in Wilmington, and they had an extended network of family and friends in the town. Together, they owned a small three-bedroom house on South Outer Drive, which was described as an up-and-coming area of town. The couple had been high school sweethearts, and they continued dating even after Kevin went off to Illinois State University. He was two years older than Melissa. He was 18 and she was 16 when they first started dating. It was while he was there that Melissa found out she was pregnant. So Kevin quit school and he moved back to Wilmington. The couple married and they had their son, Tyler. And then three years later, Riley was born. The Foxes were your quintessential American family. They were happy. They all loved each other. They spent a lot of time with their family, a lot of time with their friends. And both parents really took pride in their children. But Riley was particularly close with her dad, Kevin. She was described as a daddy's girl. In 2004, Riley was a beautiful three-year-old who loved to sing, dance, tell jokes, and catch butterflies. I love three-year-olds. The town of Wilmington is the kind of place where crime is rare and people regularly leave their homes and cars unlocked. The Foxes were no exception. They often left their front door unlocked. And Although the lock on their back door had been broken for months, they never bothered to fix it. (laughs) Instead, they just kept a stack of laundry baskets in front of the back door to keep it closed. Well, it's a small town and they felt safe. Of course. On June 5th of 2004, so that's a Saturday, Melissa went to Chicago with some friends to participate in a two-day walk sponsored by Avon to raise money for breast cancer research. Kevin took care of the children that afternoon, and then later on that night, he wanted to go to a concert with Melissa's brother, Tony. So Melissa's mom said, hey, I'll watch the kids, and Kevin dropped the kids off there. He picked up Tony, and together they drove to Chicago. Kevin had about six beers, and then after the concert was over, he and Tony went to a local restaurant with another friend. Since Kevin was driving, they spent a little time there so he could sober up. Eventually, they left Chicago, and they returned to Tony's house at about 12.50 a.m. Melissa's mother, who was Tony's mom too, dropped off Tyler and Riley at Tony's house. And when the men got there, the kids were sleeping on the couch in the living room. So Tony tells Kevin, you know, you can just leave them here for the night. You don't need to wake them up. But Kevin really wanted to get them up early the next morning to travel to Chicago in time to see Melissa finish her walk for cancer. Oh, how nice. 
nice. Apparently, the kids were really looking forward to it, too, because earlier that previous day, Kevin had taken them to an art supply store, and he picked up some poster boards and other supplies, and the kids and Kevin made signs oh, to hold up for really? Melissa when That's she crossed a, the finish line. That is adorable. Isn't it so sweet? Yes. Tony helped Kevin load the children up into the Ford Escape, and he watched as Kevin left. Earlier that day, before Melissa had left to go to Chicago for the walkathon, she washed the children's bedding and she put it in the dryer. By the time Kevin got home, he was tired. It was nighttime and he didn't feel like making their beds. So he put Tyler to sleep on an ottoman and Riley on the couch next to the ottoman. The two kids were just a few feet away in the living room right next to each other. And it wasn't uncommon for the foxes to let their children fall asleep watching TV in the living room. I do that. After laying the children down, Kevin went outside. He smoked a cigarette on the front porch. And when he was done, he went into his bedroom. He turned on the TV. He turned on his fan. And he fell asleep. It was about 2.30 in the morning. Kevin awoke around 7.50 a.m. the next morning when Tyler came into his room and told him Riley was gone. Kevin thought, okay, the kids, they are always playing hide and seek. So he didn't really panic. He went into the living room. He saw Riley's Dora, the Explorer blanket, was still on the couch. And he saw the front door was open. He knew he'd shut the front door. But he assumed Tyler maybe opened it while he was looking for Riley. Kevin started calling out Riley's name. He looked in her room, and the house was described as having ample hiding spots. So he spent quite a bit of time looking around the house. He looked out into the backyard, and he didn't see Riley there. After about 15 minutes, his sense of alarm was growing. That's got to be terrifying. Terrifying, right? Terrifying. Kevin started walking to the neighbor's house, but decided it was kind of early in the morning to be ringing their doorbell. So instead, he returned home, and he just used the phone to call them. They said they hadn't seen Riley. That's really when the reality of the situation started hitting Kevin. It was about 40 minutes after Tyler woke him up that he called the police. He was still somewhat in denial. It sounds to me a lot like he was hesitant to create a big emergency because part of him still wanted to believe Riley was just hiding somewhere. So instead of calling 911 for emergency, he called 411, which was an information number that he knew would also connect him to the police. He later said that he believed 911 was for extreme emergencies and 411 was just more kind of to get the police attention and advice. The dispatcher who received Kevin's 411 call was a local police officer. And when Kevin told him he couldn't find his three year old daughter, the officer's response was, quote, Are you kidding me? Basically, like, you want me to come help you find, find, your, your, do- find your daughter who's yeah. probably hiding someplace? The officer did drive to the Fox residence and he joined Kevin in searching this house. And this house isn't that big. Like, I mean, you can only search a three bedroom house so much. It became apparent as the minutes passed that this was not a game of hide-and-seek that Riley was playing. Backup was soon called. Other officers started to arrive. They ordered Kevin to wait outside the house as they searched. And word of the situation got out really fast. Melissa and Kevin's family members started to arrive. And Kevin realized, okay, this is important enough. This is serious enough. I need to call Melissa. As he went to call her, a police officer that he'd been talking to said, you know what, I think it's too early. Just wait a little bit. So Kevin put his cell phone back in his pocket and he started walking around the neighborhood. He's walking and he's yelling Riley's name when his phone rings and it's Melissa. Kevin just breaks down. He starts crying on the phone to her and tells her Riley's missing. Melissa at the time was on a street in Chicago doing this walkathon with her friends and hundreds of other walkers, and she literally collapsed on the street. Oh, at the I just news. got goosebumps. Her friend picked up the phone and arranged for Melissa to get back to Wilmington as quickly as possible. When Melissa arrived back there, and it's about an hour and 10 minutes away, 
The area was overwhelmed with police and neighbors who were all searching for little Riley. She found Kevin in the yard across the street from the house, and some police officers overheard her say to him, quote, Did you do something stupid? You better not be lying to me. This caught their attention and really raised their suspicions. Cops began whispering to each other about what was going on with this couple. Melissa later said that she said those things because there was just so much confusion about Riley and where she might be. And she thought that Kevin might be trying to minimize something. She just was very angry and confused and frustrated. And she was lashing out. Five hours after Kevin first called for assistance in helping find Riley. So it's roughly about 2.30 in the afternoon. They were no closer to determining where this little girl was. There was no hint as to where she could be. Police activated the Amber Alert. Within an hour after the alert went out, the police got the news they feared the most. Searchers had found little Riley, and she was dead. Aww. Her tiny body was found less than four miles from the Fox's home, floating in a creek in the nearby Forsyth Woods County Forest Preserve. Searchers found Riley face down in what's called the Fort River, but it's more like a creek. So it's not deep. At least where she was found wasn't described as being deep. Her once white flamingo t-shirt was soaked with mud and dirt, and her underwear and pajama bottoms were missing. Oh, man. I know. It's so disgusting. She was naked from the waist down. Her mouth had duct tape over it. Oh, jeez. Her hands were bound together with more duct tape, and she was cold. Rigor mortis had already set in. A later autopsy revealed wounds on Riley's legs and head, which were strangely described as defensive in nature. And I'm not head? Sure, yeah, I'm not sure how they know that, but that's what it was described in the court records, which is where I got all of my information from. The monster that killed Riley also sexually assaulted the little girl. <gasps> that poor child. She's only three. Three. The medical examiner said the rape would have been severe for an adult woman. It was absolutely at the top of the scale for a small child. Oh, my God. What does that mean? I don't know. It was a quote from the court records. Oh, my God. It just means it's really fucking bad. Yeah, really horrific. DNA was found inside her body, and an examination of the tape on her mouth found traces of DNA from the killer. The woods and creek area were thoroughly searched, and they searched for at least a mile in each direction. But they came up with very little evidence or anything they deemed relevant to the murder. In fact, basically nothing but a pair of men's shoes with faded letters E-B-Y written on the tongue were deemed to be potentially, even possibly, connected. And their significance was in doubt, considering they were found a half a mile away in this muddy, shallow water. It seemed rather unlikely that a killer would leave his shoes behind. But since the shoes didn't appear to have been in the water for very long, they ended up bagging them. Based on where Riley was found, the detectives believe that Riley had been thrown from a bridge that overlooked the Fork River. After a thorough search, they never were able to find her underwear or her pajama bottoms. They really didn't have much to go on. Strangely, a neighbor on the same block as the Foxes reported that their house had been burglarized that very same night. Someone had cut through the screen of their back door and had pushed the door open. And I think some minor items were stolen, but I'm not for sure. But police didn't pursue any connection to that break-in and Riley's murder. And that's because they were pretty confident they knew who killed Riley. Her dad, Kevin. Oh. The plot thickens. Even though Riley's battered body had been found, police decided to keep that news away from the public and also away from Melissa and Kevin. Instead... Police officers asked them to come to the Wilmington police station to be interviewed about Riley's disappearance. And the Foxes did so willingly. 
At the station, officers separated the couple and questioned them both independently. When they spoke with Melissa, they basically just asked her questions about Kevin. After about an hour, Kevin and Melissa were reunited. By that point, officers had told Kevin's dad that Riley's body had been found, and they asked him to break the news to the couple. However, the police still kept the fact that Riley had been raped and that duct tape was found on her mouth and arms. They kept that a secret from the family. At the station, when Kevin found out that Riley was dead, he collapsed. He started screaming. He started hitting the walls. Melissa and Kevin had to be escorted home. The very next day, they agreed to return to the police station where they gave the police their DNA and their fingerprints. But before I tell you more about what police originally believed happened and what really happened to Riley, we're going to take a quick break. The very next day after learning their daughter had been murdered, Melissa and Kevin returned to the police station and they had their fingerprints and their DNA collected. Voluntarily, they agreed. That's when they were introduced to Detective Scott Swergen, a Will County detective who was assigned as a lead investigator on Riley's case. Although the Foxes didn't know it at the time, from the moment Swergen first saw Riley's body floating in the creek, he theorized that someone close to her had murdered her by accident and tried to cover it up by making it look like a stranger abduction. And of course, that someone that he thought did it was Kevin. But he told the Foxes that he was focusing on a theory that the murder was committed as an act of revenge by someone who might be upset with one of them. And keep in mind, Melissa and Kevin, they didn't know Riley was raped. So they didn't question this theory. They believed that this officer was on their side and was being forthcoming with them. But they were so, so wrong. On June 22nd in 2004, 16 days after Riley's body was discovered, Swergen suggested to the Foxes that they take their six-year-old son, Tyler, to a facility where he could receive free counseling. Swergen helped set it up for them. At the facility, the Foxes met with a woman named Mary Jane Pluth, who introduced herself as a counselor. She asked the Foxes if she could talk to Tyler about what happened that night and counsel him on it. Kevin signed a consent form without ever reading Uh the fine print. If he had, he would have learned that Swergen and Mary Jane Pluth, their plan was to conduct a videotaped victim-sensitive interview, which Swergen and another Will County detective would watch from another room. Now, I didn't know what a victim-sensitive interview was, but the goal of a VSI is to extract helpful information from a vulnerable witness to assist in a criminal investigation. There was no therapy session at all. I'd be so fucking pissed. I know. It was an interrogation of a six-year-old boy whose sister had been snatched in the middle of the night, only a few feet from him, and murdered. That is so fucked up. Isn't that? Mm-hmm. I'd be so pissed. I know. I'm angry right now. Like, I have goosebumps. I'm so angry. Taking advantage of this kid. And then lying to the parents about it. Who just lost their child. That is so jacked. Mary Jane Pluth asked Tyler more than 20 times, and in myriad ways, whether his father had left the house on the night of Riley's disappearance. Tyler answered no repetitively, over and over again. He was asked 176 questions about his father. God. He became more and more upset and withdrawn. And keep in mind, his parents are not in the room with him. Over the course of the interview, he started crying, and they ended up stopping the interview when he started asking for his parents. In the end, Tyler had no information that benefited the investigation at all. I mean, he was sleeping. Right. Little happened in the investigation during the remainder of the summer, but several things happened in September that made the Foxes really start to question Swearigan's handling of the case. Before, they were just grieving, just blindly trusting the police. But now they were starting to wonder, you know, what's going on with this lead detective? 
For one thing, Melissa had learned from a friend that a young girl was abducted from her home in Laporte, Indiana, which was about an hour and a half away from Wilmington, on September 12th. And of course, the Foxes believe that's what happened to Riley. Melissa told Swearjin, and they asked him to look into it. She was surprised he hadn't heard of it himself, and he didn't seem to really care. He just got his blinders on. Big time. It gets way worse. Ugh. The Fox's doubts about Swearjin and his handling of the case were abated for a brief moment on October 26th at around 7 p.m. That's when he called them and asked them to come down to the station to talk about a big break in the case. Kevin and Melissa were ecstatic. They drove to the station thinking they were going to finally learn who did this to their little girl. However, their hope dissolved shortly after they arrived. They were led through three locked doors and then introduced to the very first time to a man named Ed Hayes. He was Swearjin's supervisor. Following the introduction to Mr. Hayes, the foxes were separated. Melissa was taken to this waiting area and told a detective would be right with her. Kevin was led by two detectives, one being Swearjin, into an interrogation room where, unbeknownst to Kevin, some 30 other officers were watching via video monitor. Oh, my God. After reading him his Miranda rights, Swearjin asked if he killed Riley. Kevin said, no. The question continued. Kevin repeated the same things he'd been telling the police for months. At around 8, 10 p.m., about an hour after he arrived at the station, Swearjin just came right out and said to Kevin, you killed Riley. Kevin was pissed. He started crying. He started jumping from his seat, yelling, I could never do that. He tried to push his way past the detective to leave. And he yelled out, if you accuse me one more time, I'm going to punch you. But one of the other detectives came in and told him, sit your ass down. So Kevin did. And these are all quotes. Swearjin and another detective started yelling at Kevin, saying they knew he killed Riley. Then they lied to him, and they told him they have fiber evidence implicating him. Every time he tried to deny it, they cut him off. Kevin finally said, I want a lawyer. Good job. Finally. I know, right? Get them off your ass. So they left the room, and they locked the door. A few minutes later, Swearjin and Supervisor Hayes came back with no attorney. Swearjin told Kevin that they had a surveillance tape from a mobile gas station showing that he had indeed left his house in the middle of the night at about 4.50 in the morning. But Kevin knew, I mean, I didn't do it, so you don't have this tape. Swearjin suggested to Kevin that, hey, I know this is an accident. I know you didn't mean to kill her. And if you just say it's an accident, we can charge you with involuntary manslaughter and you'll get three to five years. But if you don't admit to it now... You can spend maybe 30 years of your life in prison. Kevin then volunteered to take a polygraph test. They asked him if he would, and he said yes. And they kept saying, you're going to fail it if you take it. And he said, I won't. So he takes it. And where's his lawyer? He never got it. They Um, never gave him a lawyer. Wow. How about where's his wife? Right. Well, she's been waiting three hours in a room for someone to come and talk to her. Locked. Oh, my God. At one point, she began kicking the locked door and yelling for someone to come in and talk to her. It was around 11 p.m. when Swearjin appeared. He took her to an office where other detectives were waiting. That's when they told her for the very first time that Riley had been raped (gasps) and duct tape was on her and that Kevin did it. (gasps) Oh, my God. They said that? They said that. But Melissa didn't buy it, not even for an instant. She just had complete faith in her husband. At about midnight, officers brought in a pail, drained Kevin to the office where Melissa was sitting. And Kevin told her, listen, I'm going to take a polygraph test so I can pass it and we can go home. It was about 1.30 a.m. when Kevin took a polygraph exam and the examiner immediately told him and Melissa that Kevin failed. I'm sure. He's under duress. He didn't fail. Oh, he didn't? It was a lie. (gasps) Oh, my God. These police officers are so fucking horrible. I know. But Melissa turned to Kevin and she said, you know, I love you. 
I believe in you and I am 100% behind you all the way. The supervisor, Hayes, he was outside the door when Melissa made those comments and he became ballistic. He screamed to the officers, quote, get her the fuck out of this room right now. And then the detective started pulling Melissa out of the room by her arms while Hayes turned to Kevin and screamed at him, quote, you're a fucking murderer. Hayes then met Melissa in the doorway and screamed in her face, quote, your husband's a fucking liar. He's a fucking murderer. He never loved you or your fucking daughter. He killed her and you need to learn to fucking get over it. End quote. Oh my God. Melissa said that she was so terrified and felt like her soul had just been crushed. I would have went right home and called an attorney. But isn't that so? Because that's bullshit. Kevin, at this point, was falling apart. Oh, I can imagine. He couldn't believe that he'd failed this polygraph. And he couldn't believe that Hayes had just spoken to Melissa like he did. He was brought back into the interrogation room. And Hayes told Kevin that if he didn't admit to killing Riley, he would fill out the arrest form for first-degree murder right then and there. Hayes then told him that he knew people in prison that would make sure that Kevin got raped every day. my God. Isn't this so fucked up? It is. He started filling out the form for first degree murder. Another detective started banging handcuffs on the table like he couldn't wait to arrest Kevin and started calling Kevin a pussy. Wow. Hayes repeated the threats of Kevin being raped quite a few times to Kevin. At this point, does Kevin know Riley was raped? Nope. Only Melissa knows. Only the Melissa knows. Kevin was crying. At one point, a detective moved his chair up so close to Kevin that his testicles ended up being pushed against Kevin's knees. <laughs> what? That's what the court record said. I don't know what the fuck that means, but I think the point is they were in his face. Mm-hmm. One of the detectives told Kevin that his family had abandoned him and that Melissa is going to end up marrying someone else while you're in prison and another person is going to raise Tyler. But Kevin kept saying, listen, I didn't kill my daughter. I don't, I didn't do it. There was a magnet and it was read, quote, Riley in our heart. One of the detectives grabbed the magnet and he threw it at the table in front of Kevin and yelled that Riley was in heaven on her knees begging Kevin to admit what he did to her and give her some closure. Oh, man, that is so fucked up. God. Then Supervisor Hayes, who had walked out of the room, he came back, and he was holding a stack of photos. Do you know what those photos are? Riley? Dead. It's at that time that Kevin saw the crime scene photos of Riley's body in full rigor mortis, in the creek, with a duct tape on her. And that's how he learned that she'd been duct taped and raped. Then Detective Swergen, he came in the room, and he was out of breath. And he seemed really animated and really excited. And he told Kevin that he just learned that the state's attorney would give Kevin a deal if he said there'd been an accident. He said if Kevin admitted to an accident, he would bond out the next day and serve Only three years. It's a great deal. So at this point, Kevin felt like he just needed to go along with the accident story. He thought if he did, he could go home the next day. He could be with Melissa. They could get an attorney and he could clear his name. And this is how you get false confessions from people. Exactly. So Swergen began proposing accident scenarios to Kevin. And in the end, Kevin said that he accidentally hit Riley with a bathroom door. She died, even though the bathroom door, so you guys know, was hollow. Later on, it would be determined there's just no way possible it would kill somebody. It was like made of nothing. Based on the scenarios presented to him, the plausible scenarios presented to him by the police, the police and Kevin worked out that he put his finger in Riley's vagina to make it look like a sex maniac did it, and then he dumped her body into the creek. Like he faked a sexual assault on her? Yes, exactly. He faked a sexual assault on her to cover up the accident. There were a couple times Kevin would say something that didn't make any sense with the evidence, so he would be swayed to maybe perhaps change it a little bit by Swergen. In the end, Kevin 
made a full confession as to Riley's death. He told the officers he drove Riley's body to the creek and then drove home on the specific route. He threw the duct tape away at a dumpster. He came home. He left the front door open. He left the back door open and he went to sleep. Didn't the duct tape have DNA on it from the killer? Yeah, but the police never tested it. They didn't test it. Kevin ended up talking to them for 870 minutes, and only 23 of those minutes were videotaped. Oh, I hope he gets a lot of money to Leah <laughs> when he sues the fuck out of them. <laughs> Later that morning, which has actually been a day, Kevin was taken to the Will County Jail where he met with his lawyer for the first time. Unbelievable. As soon as he met with that lawyer, he said, I didn't kill her. I just needed to get out of that situation. And he asked for a lawyer like the day before. Yeah. yeah, at least 12 hours earlier. As soon as Kevin went to jail and made that confession, Supervisor Hayes called the FBI, who had been called in to help out with a case. And he told them to stop any DNA testing that they were doing oh on any God. of the evidence in Riley's case. Wow. So you were asking about the DNA. Yes. It had been sent to the FBI for testing, but it hadn't been tested yet, and it stopped. They didn't do any more testing after that because they had their man. Yeah. You know, need to test. He confessed. And, and if they found out it wasn't him, that would blow their whole case. Yeah, exactly. In the meantime, Kevin spent eight months in jail, separated from his grieving wife and his now seven-year-old son and his reputation in the community, as you can imagine. Oh, man. Was smeared. He's in jail for raping a three-year-old, his daughter, his by daughter. the way. So he didn't bond out and get out the no, next he, day. No, he did not. Oh, that was another lie? Another lie. Oh, I'm so surprised. During Kevin's incarceration, Melissa was separated from her main source of emotional support. And trying to cope with this extraordinary grief, she was left alone to help Tyler deal with Aww. his own grief. And she was put in this position of being a single parent at a time when both her and Tyler really needed Kevin. Did she stick by Kevin? Yes, yeah, she did. Oh. She was forced into Riley's birthday and the first anniversary of her death without Kevin. Aww. And she said Kevin was the only person in the world that could truly understand how she was feeling on those yeah. occasions. Well, Kevin's lawyers, they're a group of badass people. And even though the police told the FBI to not test the DNA, they had it tested. And guess what happened when the results came in from the DNA testing that the defense did? at a private lab. It showed with 100% certainty that Kevin was not the donor of the DNA found on the vaginal swab or on the duct tape on Riley's mouth. On June 17th of 2005, the day after the DNA test results were released, the prosecutor dropped the charges against Kevin and he was released from custody. And by the way, he was facing the death penalty. Oh my God. He spent 243 days in jail while Riley's killer spent 376 days free. So what happened to Riley and who did it? Yes, who did it? Well, it's not Kevin. It's not Kevin. Only six months after Kevin was released, Riley's killer raped again. Oh. For the next five years, Scott Eby shockingly managed to never show up on the investigator's radar for the murder of Riley. But you should have. You might recognize the name Evie. Yeah, they had his fucking shoes. Yes. But there was so much more that they failed to see. You're going to get so pissed off when I tell you about this. I'm just curious. Did they run the DNA through CODIS? I'm glad you asked. They only had a partial DNA. Mm -hmm. And in CODIS, you had to run, at least at the time, in 2005, you had to run full uh -huh. DNA. So they couldn't run the partial through CODIS. So listen to this. Are you ready to be pissed off? Oh, I've been pissed. On the day of Riley's disappearance, a woman named Sharon Eby called the police and asked them to perform a welfare check on her son. He lived in Wilmington. He lived less than a mile from the Foxes. Damn. And he'd left a message on her phone saying that by the time she got it, he'd be dead. He was going to kill himself. So police went to his house. And when they got there, they saw Scott. He was acting agitated. He asked the responding officers if they had found, quote, the little girl yet. And then he started vomiting. 
one of the officers had actually been at the Fox's house hours earlier and helped look for her. But for whatever reason, I didn't think there's any connection. Really? Some rando just asks about it? Right. And he's vomiting. And yeah. And he's shaking. And he's got a criminal record, by the way. None of them were for sexual offenses. Most of them were for, like, B&Es and things like that. Three weeks later, officers were called to the EB house because Scott had climbed on the roof with a rope around his neck and was threatening to kill himself. Then in December of 2005, he was arrested for the rape of a female family member. And in 2006, he was sentenced to prison for 14 years. I mean, the fact that the shoes said EB, Mm -hmm. you know, and they were found in the same creek as Riley's body should have seemed to make some sort of connection. And the fact he wants to commit suicide. Yeah, and he's right down the street. And he's just down the road. It wasn't until May of 2010, so this is almost six years after Riley's murder, that the FBI received a vague tip from Scott Eby's former girlfriend, and they decided to interview him. All I know about it is that she called and she gave a vague tip. So they went and they met with him, and he was at the Medium Security Lawrence Correctional Center in Sumner. During that interview, Scott consented to a swabbing of his mouth that would provide a DNA sample to compare with the ones they had. But he said, I have nothing to do with Riley's murder. But as soon as he left, he called his mother and he said, quote, I've done something terrible. And then he said, I need to see you right away. So his mom came to visit him in prison the very next day, and that's when he admitted to her that he killed Riley. Sharon didn't really know what to do with this info, and ironically, Scott's brother worked as a correctional officer, so she called him and told him what he said, and he called the FBI. E.B. ended up writing a five-page confessional letter and another letter saying goodbye to his mom, and he once again tried to commit suicide, but didn't succeed. In the letter, and later on in court, he gave the brutal details of Riley's last night alive. Are you ready? I suppose. You're ready. I am. He'd been drinking and using cocaine, and Scott had a history of breaking into houses. And remember how I told you the Fox's neighbor down the street had their house broken into? Well, that was Scott. He'd cut the screen, broken the house, then he crept down the street, And he went into the Fox's house through the back door. When he did, he saw that Riley was on the couch and Tyler was on the ottoman next to her. He inched through the house and he noticed Kevin was asleep in the bedroom and the fan was on and the TV was on. And he said he just decided he had to have Riley. Scott left the home and then walked back a block or two away to get his car. And he actually pulled his car up in front of the house. He then covered his face with a bandana, and he quietly entered the home again. He put his hand over Riley's mouth, and he carried her out to the car and placed her in the trunk. Oh. I know. From there, he drove his car to that park, or preserve, whatever you want to call it, about two and a half miles away, maybe three. He pulled his car into the parking lot there. He opened up the trunk, and that's when he put the duct tape over Riley's mouth. But before he put the tape over Riley's mouth, she was crying, and her very last words to him were, quote, I want my daddy. Oh, man. That's what he wrote in the confessional letter. That's fucking sad. Very sad. Jeez. Then he bound her wrists. He carried her into the public restroom, and he raped her on the floor of the bathroom. Oh. Scott described the weather as stifling hot, and at some point it got so hot that he pulled his bandana down. He wasn't even really thinking about it, but once he pulled his bandana down, he said Riley looked him straight in the eye, and he realized she could identify him, and that's when he knew he had to kill her. He picked her up, and he walked her down to the creek throwing her underwear and her pajama bottoms into the trash that was located outside the public bathroom. When he got to Fort Creek, he held her underwater by the shoulders until she quit moving. His shoes, which he had purchased previously while in prison, and that's why he wrote his name on it, E.B., because he was in prison, they got stuck in the mud 
So he left him there. Her body ended up drifting down to the spot where it was eventually found about a half a mile away. In Scott's confession, he said, quote, keeping a secret like that inside of you eats at the very core of your being day in and day out. Oh, fuck off. I know. DNA testing, in case you were wondering, it was only a partial DNA. It was linked to him. It was a weak link because it was partial, but it couldn't rule him out. Scott also said, quote, I had a reasonably normal childhood with two parents that took good care of me and they never fought. I was taught at a very young age about respect and common courtesy. My parents didn't raise a monster. I became one over the years and it's no one's fault but my own. His poor mom. I know. So the Foxes, they ended up, I know you're not going to be surprised, suing Will County. Oh, I hope they sued the fuck out of Will County. They did, and they personally sued five detectives. And they won. Good for them. It was deemed that the detectives had violated their constitutional rights. They ended up getting awarded $15 million. Wow. It got lowered to about, I think it was $8.3 million on an appeal. And they ended up working out some agreement with Will County so it didn't go bankrupt <laughs> for what it did to them. Scott Eby took a plea, and he is serving a life in prison with no chance of parole. Unfortunately, Melissa and Kevin, they ended up having another child, but they ended up divorcing. Aww. That is the very, very sad story of Man. Riley Fox. Wow. No, I did not hear about this one, by the way. Isn't that that is, so sad? That is terrible. That poor baby girl. That poor baby. That poor family. I know. Fuck Scott E.B. Right. Fuck him. I hope he rots. He's rotting. Good. Okay. Thanks for that, Talia. You're welcome. Feels so wrong when we say those things. I know. (laughs) Thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe slash follow button on whatever app you're listening to us on. Also want to remind you, we have our social media. It's at Hardcore True Crime. And we have an amazing website. (laughs) (laughs) I helped make it. It really is awesome. It's crimesandconsequences.com. You can go there to find out more information, see pictures of all the episodes we do. We have some online-only episodes that are free. They're basically our release episodes that we've archived and are online only. You can see them on our website. You can also find information on our merchandise. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. You can't shop too early for Christmas. No. Don't wait until the last minute. Don't. Check out our merch and give it to a loved one. Yeah, I mean, the Postal Service, let's be honest, in the United States. <laughs> right? I mean, it hasn't been the greatest since COVID. Yes. Don't forget to check out our Apple channel. You can subscribe to that and you can get over 100 exclusive episodes not released to the public. You can get the same thing by going to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, where you can find all of our episodes. You guys can also get early releases and ad free by joining either Patreon or the Apple channel. And you can find the Apple channel in your podcast app. Yeah, if you have an Apple product. Yes. If you're like me and you don't, you're not going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other business? I think you got it all. Well, I look forward to Tanya's Super thrilling, exciting episode coming out a week from now. <laughs> Playing it up. Thanks, Talia. And I hope you guys have a great week. Until our next episode. Don't kill each other. <laughs> Bye. Bye.